pleasure now to introduce our next panel. It will be moderated by Akshat Rati, a reporter for Bloomberg News and non-resident senior fellow with the Global Energy Center. Uh, we've discussed at length the targets we must set to reach climate goals and limit warming of the Earth's temperature. And this next panel will help us understand how are we how we are going to create and scale the technologies we need to get there. Um, Akshat, thanks for joining us and over to you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and welcome everybody uh, to Innovating the Future, uh, Green Tech Innovation Ecosystems. Uh, we know that enabling current and future generations to mitigate climate change requires urgent creation of technologies and solutions that can minimize, but also reverse uh, the impact of human activities on the environment. And these ecosystems uh, need to be fostered uh, to create the, the innovation we need in green technologies. Um, so what is the value of green tech ecosystems and what places in the world and what companies are attracting the kind of candidates um, that will create uh, the green low carbon economy uh, we all need? Uh, in this uh, session, uh, we're going to hear from uh, a, a wide variety of really excellent experts uh, in this space who've been pushing uh, green tech companies uh, to uh, be bigger uh, players uh, in the market. Um, and I'm, I'm going to briefly introduce them uh, here, uh, and then I'm going to get into uh, just early questions with them. Each of them, instead of having an opening remark, uh, is going to get an opening question. Um, and then we'll just get into conversations. Um, and if you're on the app, then uh, please send us questions uh, through the chat option. Uh, so on the panel, we have uh, Barbara Berger, who's the Vice President of Innovation and uh, President of Technology Ventures at Chevron. Uh, Peter Engelke, who's uh, the Deputy Director and Senior Fellow of the uh, Snowcroft Center on uh, Strategy and Security at uh, the Atlantic Council. Ilan Gur, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Activate, uh, and Emily, uh, so Emily uh, Reichardt, who's a Chief Exec uh, Executive Officer um, at Greentown Labs. Um, and I'll start with Peter, who has uh, very recently published uh, a paper, which you all can find uh, online now to uh, read. Uh, it's called Mapping Green Innovation Ecosystems. Um, and the idea that in innovation needs an ecosystem, that it needs uh, people and places uh, to come together in a, a specific uh, set uh, way is not new. Uh, but um, Peter, what do you think clean energy innovation has been missing, or at least you found to be the key to make it work? Well, thank you, Akshat, for the question uh, and for moderating. Is, and uh, thank you to the other uh, panelists for joining me on this, uh, for this, discussing this important topic, and to everyone uh, on behalf of the Atlantic Council, to everyone uh, um, watching uh, the program. Um, let me back up and ask a, ask a, 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 a preceding question, which is why, why we decided to write this, this paper in the first place. Um, it's based on the premise that I think we all share, which is that you know the world lacks a sufficient uh, number and correct types of um, technologies that will allow us to successfully slow, halt, and hopefully someday maybe even reverse climate change as well as other environmental threats, um, for example, biodiversity and extinction. Uh, and if we're going to have a habitable planet, then what we need to do is accelerate the rapid development and scaling. And I think we all accept that as a premise of the conversation. And in order to do that, what we need to do is we need to look at the places that produce those technologies. Um, you are correct, Akshad, and when you ask the question, um, when, you, when, you, when you state that um, tech innovation ecosystems in general are reasonably well understood, in fact, uh, I would encourage um, the uh, audience to um, take a look at some reports that I've written for the Atlantic Council where we've um, uh, examined such ecosystems uh, in depth. But the intersection between uh, what we're talking about here, which is innovating around green technologies or clean technologies or climate technologies, as they may, they're may variously called, and how these ecosystems work, that is, I don't think, as well, as well understood. And that's why we wanted to explore this topic in this paper. And I think this is unfortunate because it's not axiomatic that the world's tech innovation ecosystems are producing 
um, the uh, right amount, the right number, and, and the right um, types of green technologies and doing it at a fast enough rate. In fact, uh, I say it's axiom axiomatic because um, the fact that we still have a rapidly changing uh, climate is proof positive that we haven't produced enough of such technologies. So um, that was kind of the starting assumption for why we, why we decided to write this paper. Um, and what we, um, what we wanted to do with the paper was to ask a couple of, of, of big questions, um, which is um, how is it that some ecosystems around the world um, uh, help uh, startups and established firms overcome obstacles that they face to producing uh, green technologies. And that's based on an argument that we put forward in the paper that there are some major challenges to uh, firms, startups, for example, that, that um, produce green technologies. Uh, for example, there the technologies that they're working in often involve very difficult science and engineering problems that, uh, for example, software and digital startups don't face. They often involve um, challenging massive legacy systems, for example, in the energy system, trying to overcome the advantages that legacy systems have. Uh, there's often an unfavorable price environment that, uh, that uh, these, these firms pr uh, face. Uh, for example, it's just very difficult to, um, to get a foothold in a commercial marketplace because the pricing doesn't work necessarily. And often there's cultural resistance to scaling of new, new disruptive technologies. For example, the electric car, now we kind of take for granted, and Tesla is the most valuable uh, uh, automaker in the world by market cap. Um, but you know that wasn't the case 20 years ago, certainly. So um, how do some ecosystems um, uh, uh, overcome these obstacles? That was one of the questions we wanted to ask. What are some of the common features that, they, that the most successful of these ecosystems around the world possess? Uh, and then what does a map of the world actually begin to look like if we were to try and map the world? Um, it, it's, it's obviously there's a Venn diagram overlap between those places that we would expect to be leaders in this space. Silicon Valley would be one city, a region, uh, Boston might be another, uh, London might be another. Um, but it's not a perfect overlap. There are some places that do this more, better than other places. Uh, so that's, that's, that's the over, overview of the, of the paper that we wrote. Uh, and, and I think really what we're trying to do here is we're trying to do three, three or four different things. One is that we want to frame this problem. In other words, why does it matter that we're having a conversation about this topic in the first place? And that was one of the reasons why we wrote the paper. Second, we wanted to make sure we asked a number of important questions about the topic. Uh, third, we wanted to identify how, how these places work, or at least put on the table some, some pieces, some answers as to why they work the way they do. And then finally, we wanted to identify some, some pathways forward. So in a nutshell, what I would say is this topic really matters a lot. Uh, the places that do, there are some places that do um, green tech innovation better than other places, and we need to really understand why that is, it is the way it is. If we're going to hope to uh, overcome the climate challenge in the, in the time that we have left to deal with it, uh, and that we do need to take concrete steps to, to moving forward. That's great. I mean, that uh, it's a good segue into uh, the question I wanted to ask uh, Emily, uh, that one of the places which we know has been uh, a center of innovation, uh, not just for green tech, but for uh, uh, a lot of uh, areas has been Boston and Greentown Labs got its start in Boston uh, and now has expanded uh, to uh, a new hub in Houston. What do you think makes Boston unique and, and help uh, Greentown thrive? Uh, and, and now what lessons do you take from that experience into the new hub? So I'm happy to answer the question. And um, just to thank you to the Atlantic Council for having me this evening, midnight in Boston. So uh, hopefully it'll all come through clearly. So I'd like to start uh, by introducing Greentown a bit, just to give people a bit of a background. We're the largest climate tech incubator in North America, and we're a community of over 100 early stage companies who are tackling challenges across the largest greenhouse gas emitting sectors. And those would be electricity, buildings, transportation, agriculture, and manufacturing. Well, since our founding, we've helped over 300 companies, and these companies have collectively created at least 6,500 jobs and they have also raised $1.2 billion in capital. And they have an 
success rate once they leave Greentown Labs. So that means they continue to grow and thrive after being part of our incubator. So our headquarters uh, is actually just outside of Boston, but I think we can say Greater Boston, and that's Somerville, Massachusetts. And we there have a campus of 100,000 square feet across three buildings, a big component of which is laboratory space, uh, both prototyping lab, which is dry lab, as well as wet chemistry lab, um, where entrepreneurs can do that science and engineering that Peter mentioned. And we are embarked on our first expansion to Houston, Texas. Uh, we announced that last summer, and we are on our way to opening a facility there, which will be 40,000 square feet uh, this spring. So that is all underway. Uh, to talk a little bit about how Greentown uh, became what it is today um, is really going back to what the needs are of entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs really founded Greentown Labs. I cannot take the credit for that. I was the first employee and CEO, but the entrepreneurs had a need for inexpensive space to build prototypes after graduating from MIT. And so it was founded by four young companies that were all working on clean tech and found it valuable to form a community that then grew and grew and grew. And it grew because there was a common need for shared everything from equipment to services, um, learning from one another. It was very much a peer-driven community from the very beginning. And that uh, peer learning is very important when you're talking about clean tech and when you're talking about hardware, because creating a clean tech hardware company is really, really hard. It takes a long time. It does require that science and that engineering, and you have a lot of failures and you need to do things in laboratories and you need scientists and engineers and it's expensive. So if you have a community to support you, that becomes a really important factor in your success. And that's what an incubator does. It brings together that community, not only of peers, but also, and this gets to the bigger ecosystem question, it brings together a broader ecosystem of people that are all engaged in the success of the startups. And so that includes investors, that includes universities who provide talent and ideas and new startups. It includes, frankly, folks in the political spectrum, whether they be policymakers or folks that are in agencies that support these startups through grant making at their very earliest stages. Other types of professionals like legal and accounting services are important. And of course, large corporations um, we have Barbara Berger on this panel today, and she's an excellent example of uh, what a forward-thinking company can do with their innovation arm, uh, specifically around investing in young companies, but also uh, doing good work within an ecosystem to bring other folks together. So the corporate partners are important. Um, finally, I'd say that Greentown does not exist in a vacuum of other ecosystem organizations that are also supporting startups. And in Boston, we're very good at working together. Uh, all of the leaders of these organizations know each other. We talk to one another. We help each other find new talent and uh, support each other during times like COVID. And so the ecosystem, the startup support organizations also work together. So when you look at the Boston ecosystem, what you see is that people work well together and you have a lot of different players who are all engaged in producing, supporting, and growing startup companies, um, whether they be investors, corporates, universities, startup support organizations, uh, politicians, you name it, uh, that group comes together to do that. When I look to the Houston ecosystem, and what we're doing there, I see some commonalities that are very important. One is that there are a group of startups with a need and there isn't really another organization right now that is convening a community around climate tech specifically and is providing resources to entrepreneurs and a way to bring together all of the different resources they need that make up an ecosystem. And so that's something that we are going to be bringing to Houston. Second thing is there is a very important thing that is happening in Houston that I'm 
personally excited about, and that is that we think of Boston, we think of Silicon Valley or San Francisco, the Bay Area, when we think of what's going on in terms of climate and moving the ball forward on the energy transition. But there is a lot of excitement, passion, and commitment to making this transition happen in Houston as well. And that's among the business community, it's among the civic leaders, it's along, among the professional service providers, it's among the students at the universities who are wanting to start new companies and get involved um, as talent that will serve this industry. So I feel like the early makings of a strong ecosystem are definitely there in Houston. And we look forward as Greentown to come in and help by convening that community the way that we have in Boston for many years. Uh, that's great. And, and thank you for making my job easier in, in bringing in Barbara, who I wanted to ask about that exact thing, which is how does a company of your size uh, support the creation of these kinds of ecosystems that we need uh, both within the company and outside? Thanks, Sasha. And I do uh, thank the Atlantic Council for um, showing me what 11 p.m. in Houston looks like. Uh, I'm normally not uh, not sitting in front of my computer. Thank you. Um, so a couple of things, uh, you know, I'll first talk about Chevron and then specifically about how we engage. Um, yeah, I think you, you know um, our company and I want to focus really on, you know, how our approach to the energy transition. And you know, we've got a number of different action areas around our, our core assets and our current business. And just like any company where you want to make your current business as solid as possible, you also want to plan for the future. And in part of planning for the future is a tie to what Peter said. There, there is a need for a number of different areas of low carbon technologies that, that, that are not ready to be used yet. So that's really front and center for the work that I do. And, um, you know, we, I, I run Chevron Technology Ventures and I'm the head of innovation for Chevron. And we um, have over two decades of experience on figuring out how to engage with the innovation ecosystems, support, nurture, help, champion, and then importantly, how do you integrate it into the energy system? Because I think that's one of the keys in the energy transition is we're not gonna throw the energy system away and get a brand new one. This is like the ultimate integration play because it's a system, it's very complex. And so we, we need to be able to integrate and to be able to scale. And so a lot of what we think about is how do we as a corporate player foster the innovation and ensure that we're thinking about the same problems and really the granularity of the problem we're trying to solve. And then we're there to help um, give feedback on whether the solution is addressing the problem and then how can we help scale it? And our operations and um, our needs are a great opportunity for the startups to in fact partner from a, from a scale perspective. And scale is so important in energy and without scale, um, the technologies don't really have the impact. So a lot of, and I will refer to Chevron as the mothership because you know, we always talk about our mothers in very positive ways. Um, but it's for me, one of the key sort of home runs that we do is actually integrating it in and changing the mothership. And so we kind of have this dual role or bridge to the outside and then to the inside. Um, say one thing about the ecosystems and we've um, you know had the absolute um, pleasure to work with both um, cyclotron road and now activate and green town um, and and several others throughout the world because um, innovation is is quite a decentralized activity by its nature um, but but the organizations that Elon and Emily represent um, our godsends in this. They are they they're a catalyst that brings people together. They provide very specific support and services to their members um, and the kinds of things that can help build those businesses. But they also bring a community together, and I think Emily touched on that. And um, you know that's a really important part for us as Chevron is how do we um, build the bridges between 
not the other corpse. We kind of understand how each other works, you know, but it's between corpse and small companies, you know, the big buildings and the small buildings between the new and the old, the incumbent and the disruptor. I think the, the energy transition has to bring all those things together. And, uh, you know, we, we, um, we pride ourselves, I think, in being a pretty good partner in all of that for quite a long time. Great. Well, um, Elon, in this case, uh, you know, when you look at Peter's paper, he uh, points to eight different players in the ecosystem. And two of those players uh, are incubators and accelerators. Uh, it activates started off uh, with Cyclotron Road, which is an accelerator. Could you uh, try and help uh, the audience understand the difference and and how um, how uh, Activate and Greentown Lab you know work with each other uh, in this ecosystem? Sure, um, and and thanks to the the panelists here for for the engaging discussion and the audience um, and and the council for putting on this conversation. Um, I think it's worth. I, I don't know whether Emily would agree, but but I somehow sometimes laugh on the semantics between accelerator and incubator. Um, for me, it, it, it's helpful to zoom out and understand. Well, what is it that we actually need to do to get the ecosystem to thrive? Um, and in my experience, uh, I've thought about it, um, it through the lens of of kind of three legs of a stool. Right. Our goal is to get innovation from the earliest stage of a, of a concept, an idea. It might be something from an academic lab. Um, and we need to get that over multiple chasms, you know, from that concept to something that can be seen as a product, can be valuable in the marketplace, uh, can then be manufactured or distributed. Uh, and ultimately can be adopted at, at scale um, and sold through the market. When you think of that whole path, I, I think of three things. One is uh, we need to think about the talent that's needed every step of the way and how that scales and is supported. We need to think about the infrastructure that's needed, um, both for the innovation and ultimately the deployment of the technologies. And, and then we need to think about the capital. Um, and so, uh, you can think whether it's incubators or accelerators, you can always think about, well, what are they providing here? Is it about talent and community? Is it about infrastructure? Is it about capital? And fundamentally, we need all the pieces to come together. The organization that I run, Activate, which has its origins in, in a program called Cyclotron Road, which we created in Berkeley, um, really focuses on the talent piece. Um, very uniquely, not exclusively, but very uniquely on the talent piece. And, and the framing uh, for us is as follows, you know, we know that addressing climate change is going to require us to reimagine and reinvent the physical world and global economies at a scale we've never seen before. Um, and so we're going to need new science, as you said in the, in the tee up to the panel, we're going to need new science and technology at enormous scales um, and with enormous diversity. Um, but uh, we also need the translation of those new science and ideas into the marketplace. Uh, one of the things that uh, was a motivating factor for us in creating Activate was the understanding that entrepreneurship is such a powerful force for taking ideas and getting them to scale in the marketplace. But entrepreneurship plays a very undersized role in driving new scientific discoveries to market, especially the hard science discoveries that we need to think about physical systems. And it's largely because the barriers for taking an entrepreneurial path in the hard sciences are exceptionally high. And Peter mentioned a, a little bit of this. You know, Translating this sort of research requires more time it requires more funding and capital. It requires a different set of infrastructure than, for instance, creating a, a digital technology um, on a computer or an app. Meanwhile, if you look at the system from a talent standpoint and you think about the bottlenecks, you know, we have an enormous pool globally of scientific talent and ideas that could lead to transformational solutions to, to climate. Just to give you an example, in the US alone, we graduate 40,000 science and engineering PhDs every year. So these are individuals that we've trained to be cutting edge experts in physics, chemistry, material science. They have the capacity to build these new technologies, but only a minuscule fraction of those are gonna see the next step beyond the research lab towards an application or product or a business. So Activate, which we created is a nonprofit that works between government and academically funded science 
and the private sector in this gap. Uh, and our goal is to empower scientists and engineers to be fiercely entrepreneurial in driving their discoveries out of the lab and into the market. What we recognized was that by creating a secure and dedicated path for that talent at the earliest stages, you have to think about this, you know, there's a point at which the scientist is no longer academic, they don't want to write papers, um, but they don't yet have something that is a product or a business that could sit at an incubator or scale. Um, and we realize that by supporting those people at the right time, we can actually reduce that barrier uh, to the entrepreneurial path, shift the equilibrium point, and get much more of those talent and ideas into the game, so to speak, uh, making an impact. And so the model that, that we now run, uh, again, started in Berkeley, we actually now have a community in Boston, in part because of the thriving ecosystem there. Uh, the model we run is to run a competition once a year, find talent globally, top scientists and engineers who have both the, the ideas, but also the motivation to invest their life into turning something into a product or business and doing so entrepreneurially. And we give them a two-year fellowship to essentially make that transition. Um, we start with those people. We provide the right resources to enable this type of innovation, uh, which is, it's not, you know, it's not a six-week accelerator that you might see for a digital startup. Uh, it's actually two years with access uh, to world-class research labs. So through partnerships with Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in Berkeley, University of California, MIT Lincoln Lab, uh, and actually now in partnership uh, with Greentown Labs as well, we're able to give these fellows access to infrastructure uh, and scientific facilities to work on their technology, but also, as Emily said, surround them with a community of folks, like-minded folks, who are thinking about how to translate these types of technologies into the market. And so as an example, uh, we have corporate partners, we have venture partners, um, we have other entrepreneurs that are constantly interacting with our fellows. Uh, Barbara is a great example on the corporate side. You know, Here you have Barbara, a PhD in chemistry, who now is an executive at one of the companies that could easily be adopting the technologies um, that can help guide the innovations that these fellows, these innovators are happening at the early stage. And so just to give you a sense, you know, we've been around for almost five years. We've supported 83 of these fellows to date. Mm -hmm. That's allowed us to catalyze nearly 60 uh, mission-driven companies in climate that we believe otherwise wouldn't exist. And that for us is the important part. The intervention point is early enough that we're going from zero to one. And these are now category leaders in areas like carbon utilization, uh, geothermal energy, uh, energy storage, transportation. And the way we now play with other parts of the system is by creating and feeding now that talent as these nascent companies uh, to be able to benefit from programs like Emily's uh, in Boston, you know, hopefully in other parts of, of the country and the world, um, and then be interacting in the marketplace, uh, garnering investment and starting to do projects with the, the broader corporations. That's great. Um, I mean, that leaves us with a lot of uh, different areas we can get into. I just want to remind the audience that if you have questions, uh, you can submit them through the Q&A function on uh, the app. Um, and so I'm, I'm just going to do, you know, this might be uh, trying to trying to connect the strands between uh, the, the different answers here. But I think one that we didn't touch upon and I'd love for uh, Peter to expand on is, you know, we have this push from uh, private companies, uh, you know, Barbara spoke about her experience. We have uh, a push from private investors who are supporting the kinds of uh, companies that Emily and Ilan are, uh, are, are helping create. Um, what role does government play and what specifically can governments do to support these ecosystems, Peter? Yeah, I mean, I, look, I think government has a very important role to play in, in this space in particular. I mean, governments set often enabling conditions that, that, um, that encourage the development of these ecosystems in the first place. Uh, and that uh, that help on on both the the uh, the sort of the input side on the on the on the uh, the, um, the, the on the talent side on the research and development side on the infrastructure side but also on the other side of the equation too which is on the scaling and deployment side right so um, one way to think about it is what different levels of, of government are responsible for doing what uh, in, in, in this kind of an equation. So local governments um, are critical 
um, actors in that they, they, they have important roles to play in supporting uh, through a variety of, of mechanisms, uh, the, the, the uh, gestation of the kinds of communities that the other panelists are talking about, right? Through creating policies that signal to um, local stakeholders, uh, to uh, talent who might be interested in locating from abroad, including entrepreneurs and investors, that um, the local ecosystem is serious uh, about, um, uh, about uh, uh, a, a long-term presence in the sort of green uh, space, if you will. So if you take a look at around the world at those ecosystems that are considered to be at the cutting edges of innovation in green technologies, clean technologies, climate technologies, they, the local governments consistently have policies, uh, and this has been, a, I think, a trend that you can point to over the last decade at least, if not longer, that are oriented towards uh, a mixture of things that focus on uh, um, enhancing the place as a, a desirable place to live, so livability issues. That is also a place that um, is, is focused on, on increasing the sustainability of the place, in other words, reducing the environmental footprint of life in that place. Uh, and at the same time is interested in, in encouraging the development of a tech-driven and in tech innovation ecosystem. And those three things together are considered to, to be symbiotic. In other words, they go together in a, a complementary fashion as opposed to an oppositional fashion. So if you take a look at London again, or Boston or, or Los Angeles, uh, they all have similar kinds of thrusts in all three of those directions. And I think that that's absolutely critical because there's an, and there's a, uh, an assumption that, um, that one should have both a, a, a greener uh, footprint in terms of how one lives one can at the same time have a higher quality of life in a city that functions in a greener way. And at the same time, you're going to create the conditions in which uh, the kinds of people that we're talking about on this call um, will want to locate and do the kinds of things that, that, um, uh, that result in, in innovative um, new technologies. So the most cutting edge governments, if you will, recognize this equation, mayors and, and city councils around the world, and they see that this equation is there for the taking. So the idea that you can have a green and sustainable city is also exactly the same kind of thing that will get you um, a more thriving and vibrant ecosystem. Right. So that's one layer of, of, of what governments do. At higher levels of, of government activism, um, uh, you know, certainly if you're looking at, at what national governments can do, you know, they're absolutely critical as well in, in a variety of ways. Again, on the infrastructure side, they do, um, uh, they, they make uh, important Public investments, not just in hard infrastructure, airports are critical for, um, for instance, um, so for connectivity for uh, actors in these ecosystems to have a good connectivity to um, other, other nodes around the world. But uh, certainly in terms of research laboratories and universities where a lot of the hard science is done, uh, critical, that, that was a foundational element of the American uh, experience after the Second World War is, is dramatically scaling um, uh, the R&D presence of American universities to facilitate the development of new technologies. But there are a whole host of other things that we um, often don't necessarily consider to be um, uh, part of this equation, but very much are. So education clearly is one, but uh, immigration policy is another big one. So um, the, the leading uh, tech innovation ecosystems around the world are uh, consistently uh, open to um, to uh, migration, in migration of highly talented people. In fact, one could argue that this is a, a hyper competitive environment. So attracting the most talented people in the world is a major part of the equation. And that has a lot to do with a, a country's immigration policies, not just whether or not you can get a visa and the terms under which one can get a visa, but also whether or not you're encouraged if you're um, successful at, for example, creating a, a technology company, whether or not you, you can be granted citizenship which is not, not something that we can take for granted in, in all places around the world. So there are a host of, of, yeah. of other things that I don't need to go into, a laundry list of other kinds of, of policies um, that also speak to questions about, for example, the scaling of, of green technologies on the uh, uh, carbon, um, uh, carbon pricing and, and, and these kinds of, of elements, but I'll stop there. Yeah. Um, one uh, follow-up that I wanted to ask Emily uh, is that you, um, you, you know, the way Greentown was created was organically, right? Companies came together, uh, saw the the saw the needs that they wanted to meet, and and 
it became uh, this ecosystem on its own. Now, once you have an ecosystem, especially of the size that Greentown is, uh, it also starts to shape how ideas come to play. So, you know, if it's a if it's a startup in a if it's a startup idea in a university, uh, you know, maybe being placed in Greentown gives them a higher opportunity to interface with investors um, um, and get their idea off the ground. How do you help other ecosystems like Greentown then come up? Uh, as well, you know, how do you create the competition between ecosystems, or is that does that not matter at all? Um, on competition between ecosystems, I am not a big believer. Um, I think that the climate problem is big enough that there's room for everyone to be engaging. Um, that's my philosophy generally when it comes to other organizations in our space. Um, you know, we're all doing something slightly different, whether you're an incubator, accelerator, a fund, uh, something, we need everything we can get um, attacking this problem and helping entrepreneurs. So in terms of thinking about how different ecosystems work together, I would really point to the, how we work together as leaders really across the nation uh, through different um, groups that have been set up over the years originally through the Department of Energy, U.S. Department of Energy, um, but who have then sustained themselves on them their own. Um, one example would be the Incubate Energy Network, which uh, was really started with a few incubators that won a Department of Energy grant, but the DOE, DOE found value in inviting other incubators that had not won the grant to convene together and share best practices. That was 2014, so nearly seven years ago, and that group still convenes. Um, we've gone after proposals together. We continue to share best practices. We meet up at major meetings like ARPA-E, which is a big one for our industry. And it's kind of a, you know, what we do is a bit of a labor of love. So you need others in your industry that are equally committed to supporting climate tech entrepreneurs and figuring out the best way to do it. And often it's these peers that are your best supports in uh, pushing your own organization forward. And you, you learn from them. And we also will be constantly sharing opportunities. We run competitions, we run, confusingly, we're an incubator that runs accelerator programs. And so we have, you know, basically searches that we do for startups that will be part of those accelerator programs and we share them within this incubate energy network of other incubators and accelerator programs we're all focused on climate tech and clean tech so i think there's more value in thinking about how the ecosystems can work together and support one another and you know government actually has a real role to play in that and i'm hopeful in a biden administration that some of this programming that got its start under the Obama administration, which of course was more climate forward than the most previous administration, will find their way again to supporting the best practice sharing and really lifting up these organizations, which are really all over the country. Uh, you know, when the Incubate Energy Network was founded, there were certainly representatives from Boston and New York and California, but there were also incubators in Chicago and Michigan and Wisconsin and Texas and North Carolina. So there are many organizations that are, are working on this challenge of supporting entrepreneurs doing climate tech and any way that we can bring them together across ecosystems, I'd say is worth doing. Um, and a question, a follow-up question to Elon. One of the um, requests that I've, I've often got as a journalist having put out stories about climate solutions and climate uh, startups is people who are interested, uh, who are currently working in either large corporations or have comfortable jobs, who see that they want to do more on climate and want to transition from uh, that industry into climate, you know, is does Activate help those people? And if not, where can they go? Uh, to find uh, the resources needed to make that transition, which isn't easy if you're a working professional with 5, 10, 15 years of experience. Yeah, um, I would say, and I'm curious whether Barbara, Emily, Peter might agree, but 
uh, I think that phenomenon is happening now more than I've ever seen it. And, you know, I was trying to start a company back in the, you know, clean tech 1.0 boom, but um, it, it's really incredible the, uh, the amount of talented folks from a number of different industries that are just making a personal commitment. Uh, not, not, I think not just from, from a standpoint of moral imperative, but from a standpoint of opportunity to say, I wanna be part of this transition. Um, and uh, again, you know, if you go back to that idea of, of talent and infrastructure and, and capital, you know, there's an increasing amount of capital flowing into this space. Um, and actually, I, I think the idea of talent, there is right now, I think, a mismatch in terms of supply and demand of talent, because you have people from other fields and industries that want to get in, and you have growing companies that want to hire, and yet that transition is tough. Um, you know, Activate, we focus very, very narrowly on this subset of, of the kind of scientist you know, the very hard science early stage um, proto company that then turns into a company. Um, we've had fellows that have come into our program that we've supported uh, that actually come from industry that may have been in another startup, um, generally scientists and engineers. We've also done a lot to try and connect um, other folks in to, to be part of these early companies that come out of our program. Um, but frankly, it's, it's the talent ecosystems that I think provide a lot of, um, a lot of benefits. So if you're in Boston, when, well, you know, if we could put COVID aside, obviously, for a moment, <laughs> I, I think of amazing memories of, of being in Boston and being able to show up at an event at, at Greentown Labs where there might be, you know, a few hundred people there um, mixing around and someone from Chevron might be there uh, from the local companies. And that's now an opportunity where if you're looking into the space, you can come and just engage with the community and, and try and benefit from the serendipity of the ecosystem. You know, we at Activate are trying to simulate that virtually. Obviously, Greentown is as well, as are other incubators, accelerators. You know, there's a great community, um, uh, My Climate Journey, uh, that uh, a friend of, I think, several of us, uh, Jason Jacobs, has started, which is really creating a, a, a very open community around climate as a... Um, uh, as a thematic, and they're see and seeing a lot of cross disciplinary and cross geography talent. Um, but I'd say that you know I think there are actually opportunities there too. Uh, and I think over the next, frankly, over the next year, we're going to start seeing much more dedicated programs to support talent in that transition. Um, there are a number that are popping up. Um, actually, can I weigh yeah. in on that one. Um, yes, please. The the one thing I would say is that you know we we. Have we maybe have this mindset that things are binary. You know, you work in a big company or you work in a startup or you're an investor. And the fact of the matter is when you think about this ecosystem, there are there there, there are a lot of shades of gray. And so, you know, there are uh, partners in law firm that are doing um, additional work to help in the ecosystem. There are corporates that also are advising, mentoring. There are ones that have, you know, stuff on the side and they're, they're bootlegging at this point. There are um, startup uh, people that are working in startups, but also doing a bunch of other things. So I just think, you know, the, the roles are, are very multidimensional and varied um, in terms of what is needed and what is possible. Um, and I, you know, Elon, you reminded us that at one point we had, you know, these uh, serendipitous uh, encounters. But I think, you know, the connections and the ex exploration of different roles uh, is, is something that does happen in these communities. Um, and so I don't think it's just very, you know, you're either here or here. I think there's a lot of different opportunities and ways to contribute. Yeah, no, that's a I, good point. I, yeah, I, I, just add to that. I think. I just wanted to uh, repeat uh, what Elon said about my climate journey as being a wonderful entry point. Uh, you can find that online. It's a podcast series, but increasingly a community where folks can go and learn about all the different challenges related to climate and really what the opportunities are. So that's a great uh, thing. While we can only do virtual events and there's only so many Zoom calls um, you want to be on in a given evening, but um, at some point we will be back to bringing people together 
in person and, and then there will hopefully be more opportunities for people to just drop on in and network because that is also very much magic of what incubators and, and um, space-based programs can do. Yeah, I'll try to, if I could weigh in real quickly on this. I mean, I think that the, the last few minutes of this conversation speaks to, um, you know, I, I think that the more optimistic uh, the trend line really. And yes, this is a, a, a hard problem that we're dealing with, with right at the end of the day, which is how, how, as all of us have said in various ways, how do we more rapidly identify and scale technologies that can really solve these environmental problems and do it fast, do it fast enough, right? And, and that's the hard problem. And I mean, Ilan and Emily and Barbara have all spoken in, in various ways to, you know, the, some of the difficulties of getting, getting past these barriers um, uh, that, we've, that we've discussed. But the optimistic side is, is also what we've been, been talking about here, which is that, that you know, the, the idea of becoming an, uh, an entrepreneur, of doing, doing something that's entrepreneurial in this space is, I think, an expansive one to, to an increasing number of people and an increasing number of places. And to uh, something I, I'm certain that you want to talk about at some point is that this is not limited, of course, to the United States. Uh, the geography of, of innovation uh, the, the economic geography of innovation is very much an international phenomenon. Uh, and so there's just simply more places and more people around the world doing this. And so it's becoming a more common um, part of the, the global economic landscape, frankly. Um, and it's one that um, uh, not just for climate purposes, uh, not just for uh, tackling climate change, um, but also in terms of um, you know, economic competition, and even geopolitical questions uh, are also very much involved in which places in which countries are at the cutting edge of, 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 of all of this. Um, but more narrowly to the point I think we've been talking about here is that, is that you just get it, there is a larger pie, I think, in terms of the number of people and number of institutions that are doing this kind of work. And that's the really good news, I think, in this, in, in this equation. Yeah, no, I was going to bring this up and, and thank you for bringing it up on your own, which is uh, in your paper where uh, you come up with at least um, an analysis based on the number of startups being created in countries, uh, clean tech startups. Um, it, it was a little bit surprising to me uh, that India ranked fifth. Uh, you know, we, we've talked a lot about um, the innovation ecosystem in the US and for very good reasons, we know that the U.S. has been a leader in spending uh, on R&D, and uh, and it helps that sort of base uh, investment helps you create uh, innovative startups. India doesn't have that kind of R&D budget, and yet to see India uh, ranked fifth, um, you know, not no not no surprise that the U.S. is top, but India being fifth was was surprising to me. So. I know we are coming up towards the end of the hour, and one thing that I wanted to touch upon right from the start, so that Peter made the point, if we look at what we, where we need to be, we are not there because we are not cut, cutting emissions fast enough. We are not getting enough companies and innovations um, scaling up to be able to cut em emissions fast enough. So that's an indictment of where, where we are. But also we've got to start, right? We've got places like Greentown Labs and Activate, uh, and corporations like uh, Chevron involved in this ecosystem now. So I want to get right into the middle of that. What, what are the, the limitations you feel right now, having had the creation of these ecosystems and yet not being able to solve this problem? What are you know, maybe one or two limitations that, uh, or challenges uh, that you want uh, this ecosystem that you are part of to overcome uh, in the next two to three years? Um, and, and we'll just go around the table and, and maybe we can start with Barbara. So as I mentioned, scale, right? So, um, and, you know, I think that's what we, one of the things we, we bring is where we can see an opportunity to take something uh, beyond the prototype or beyond the lab into a field operation. Um, and, you know, there's, there's business models, there's infrastructure and stuff, but just um, having the leadership to take it to the next level. We need to do a lot more of that um, on a number of different technologies, whether you're talking about carbon capture, you're talking about hydrogen and so forth, is, is, is that piece 
there's real there are good partnerships in that space and i've seen an acceleration counterintuitively during covid for scale you'd think it might slow down but i think it's actually increasing but that, to me that's where we'll start to get the impact um, right. and scale of hardware is different than scale of software i'll just leave it at that <laughs> yeah and i i think that's a very good point to acknowledge um you know as a as a climate journalist march when we were all starting to go into lockdown uh you know i sort of it was supposed to be the year of climate 2020 uh with a big meeting coming up here in the uk where i live and um I, you know, I was worried that in what is clearly a bigger crisis right in front of our eyes, we'll, uh, you know, the world will take a step back and not care about climate, but exactly the opposite happened. Uh, you know, uh, while we are looking out and, and trying to grapple with the pandemic, the interest in climate change has just gone up. Um, so back to the conversation, Emily, you know, one or two things that you'd like to, you know, uh, take up as challenges to overcome in, in the next couple of years in this space you are? The top two that would help are one, capital, and two, policy. Uh, you know, capital, both for the startups, but, you know, when we think about what could we do if we had both Ilan and I with our program, it, more capital to be able to expand further and share our knowledge more broadly. You know, it's hard to come by um, because our in, our sector, you know, though thus far has been relatively starved for it. So I think that that is both for the ecosystem organizations, those that are convening and helping startups grow, as well as for the startups themselves, there's more capital needed. And then I think uh, we're all looking forward to increased U.S. leadership or really any U.S. leadership on climate. And that does send a market signal. I mean, I think that you're absolutely right in a time when corporations could have retrenched during 2020, during COVID, I think we saw exactly the opposite. And I can certainly say we work with probably 50 corporate partners and of those I'd say something like at least 20%, 30%, probably made some a new announcement last year about their commitment to climate. Um, you know, could be a net zero by 2050 goal or some such thing. Uh, in those market signals, but the government um, providing that bigger signal that this is the way the world is going. And frankly, everyone, every other major country in the world has already done the signal, except the US. So I think that that will make a big change in the next two to three years, because it, it signals that it makes sense to invest in this area. Um, and if you're a student, it makes sense to take a job in this area because you're gonna have a career. So there's lots of signaling that needs to happen in order for us to continue to move forward as rapidly as we need to. Right. And I wanted to throw in two numbers uh, which uh, point to, to that answer, which is um, between 2013 and 2019, uh, the amount of money going into clean tech according to a, a very recent Price Waterhouse Cooper uh, report was up from $400 million to $16 billion. So that's a 40 times growth in um, in just six years. And yet, um, if you look at the kind of investment we need in clean tech, uh, we need in the order of $2 trillion a year. Um, and that's all investment, not just startup ecosystems. And currently we are at $500 billion. So there's still a, a multiplier of four that we need to overcome. And so it just sort of speaks to uh, the, the place we are in. We've started, but we really need to um, uh, accelerate from here. Um, same question to you, Elan. You know, one or two challenges that you are hoping uh, to, to address in the next few years. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll try and connect the dots um, between some of the comments from Barbara and Emily. I mean, I think I think Barbara's right. You know, to to solve to solve the CO two problem, uh, we need scale, <laughs> and we need scale of a lot of things that we already know. Um, what I often think about is, you know, it, it's insufficient to solve the CO two problem in the sense that we need to address climate change, but we need to address climate change in a way that also allows us to continue to lift up livelihoods around the around the world. 
Um, and so when you think about that coupled goal and that coupled objective, um, from my perspective, the early stage innovations are going to be the accelerants and the boosters that allow us to to you know meet those those couple of objectives, right? This is not, as Barbara said earlier, this is not a binary thing. It's not a yes or no. Um, it's going to be a yes and for a long time. Uh, and so for me, you know, I, I get a lot of of inspiration and hope in in what we're doing and what I see happening at Retail Labs and other places around the enormous opportunity to to empower talent. Um, again, through the talent themselves, the, the infrastructure and the capital to be entrepreneurial and driving solutions. And what I would say is, you know, we're, we're orders of magnitude away from either meeting the demand of innovation that we need or meeting the supply of, of talented individuals. Um, one of the things we're thinking very deeply about at Activate as we think about expanding, um, you know, we've started in Berkeley and Boston, places that have thriving innovation ecosystems. If our goal is to empower people to go what we think of as from zero to one, you know, to take someone with an idea that otherwise wouldn't see the light of day and enable them to do that, the biggest opportunities there are going to be outside the centers of the current centers of talent and infrastructure and capital. Um, and so I think, you know, whether it's around policy uh, or otherwise, figuring out how we create more of these ecosystems and create more of these opportunities in more places, um, I just think is an enormous opportunity. So looking forward to it. That's great. Uh, and, and same question to you, Peter, one or two things. Uh, you yeah, think, I think, uh, uh, I think it, uh, it awesome. stole my thunder there at the, the final, the final, uh, final couple of sentences. I mean, I, I guess I'm the one panelist here who's not actually not, you know, in an in ecosystem, uh, you know, doing this uh, every single day. Um, uh, having said that, of course, I'm, I'm an enormous fan of, of their work and uh, acknowledge its critical importance. Um, I do sit in the Atlantic Council, which has a, a, a function uh, in the world, and that and that function is to raise these kinds of, of issues, um, to raise, as I said at the outset, to frame why this matters for a global audience, uh, not just an American audience, but a global audience, that this does in fact matter a lot. It's critical to all of our futures, uh, and therefore to do a couple of things. And one is to... Um, is to is to to um, begin building uh, a stakeholder community uh, around the world to have this kind of a conversation, have it more more routinized, uh, to embed this conversation uh, uh, amongst other groups that the Atlantic Council engages, uh, policymakers, for example, in the U.S. and elsewhere in the world, uh, and to do the kinds of things that Alan just said, to basically, uh, in the immortal words of George W. Bush, uh, you know, build the pie higher. Um, and um, you know, to do more and better of of, of uh, what all of uh, all of the other panelists are doing uh, every day. So to um, you know, to build, for example, better uh, measurement systems for understanding how these ecosystems work and which ones work well. Uh, to figure out best practice um, best practices so that we can transfer learning across ecosystems more rapidly. And then ultimately, of course, to influence the policy conversation so that we can get the best. Policy um, policy supplied, um, you know that to me is is the function that the Atlantic Council should have uh, going forward. All right, so we have about ninety seconds left, and and I'm going to do this uh, very rapidly, and you only get to answer in a couple of words. Um, you know, you all look at technology uh, as a uh, as the uh, you know uh, in area where. There are lots of different technologies that need to address the climate problem. What is the one technology that you think isn't yet uh, getting as much talent or interest or startups uh, that you would like? So just one technology area that you think uh, is uh, a place where more people should be paying attention. Barbara. Hard to wait sector. All right, Emily. Carbon capture and what you do with that carbon, what's captured. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to just, I, you know, we've, we've all these fellows, I can pick any of them, um, but I've, I've recently been geeking out about the enormous opportunities to innovate in electric motors. Um, you know, we're still in kind of the, the stone age of electric motors, as far as I can tell, and there's a lot of really incredible stuff coming. Yep, and Peter. Well, I really know nothing about it, but it seems to me doing something about ocean acidification um, 
seems to me really important. Uh, well, that's on cue. Thank you very much. We are uh, out of time. Uh, thank you so much for the thoughts. Uh, as Barbara said, there are lots of shades of gray in this space and we could talk forever. Uh, but thanks again for all your time and, and for the audience for listening in. Thank you.